Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for coming. So it's 8.02, so I'd like to introduce the proceedings and get us on the way. Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Torpy, and I'm director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies at the Graduate School of the City University of New York, sometimes called the Graduate Center. We're pleased today to have with us Professor Daisaku Higashi of Sofia University in Tokyo, who will talk about three challenges of ending the war in Ukraine. Until just a few weeks ago, the war in Ukraine was perhaps the major international security topic in Western countries, such as the United States. In the meantime, however, as you all know, Hamas attacks on innocent civilians near the Gaza Strip have, uh, have unleashed a chain of violence that seems only at its beginning. Israel is bombarding the Gaza Strip to root out Hamas, but at great cost, we don't know how great in civilian lives. The events in the Middle East may have displaced the Ukraine war from the headlines, but the conflict there remains a major threat to international security. We're therefore fortunate to have Dr. Higashi's thoughts on how we might bring that conflict to an end. Let me introduce him to you now. So as I've already mentioned, Dr. Daisaku Higashi is Professor of International Relations at Sophia University in Tokyo. He's a leading scholar on mediation during armed conflicts and peace building in post-conflict states. Dr. Higashi recently published the book, How Can We End the War in Ukraine? Limits and Potential of Mediation, which came out in February 2023 in Japanese. In English, he has published the book, Inclusivity in Mediation and Peace Building, the UN, neighboring states, and global power with Edward Elgar last year in 2022, and the book Challenges of Constructing Legitimacy in Peacebuilding, Afghanistan, Iraq, Sierra Leone, and East Timor, which came out with Rutledge in 2015. He is a PhD in political science at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, where I once taught. Uh, and he then worked for the UN assistance mission in Afghanistan as a team leader for reconciliation during 2009-2010. He also has served as minister counselor in the Japanese mission to the UN in uh, charge of mediation and peace building during 2012 to 2014. Dr. Higashi will speak for perhaps half an hour, after which we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. If you have a question, please raise your hand, if symbolically, of course, uh, or enter it into the chat, and we will try to get to it. We'll end the, the discussion at 9.30 at the latest, 9.30 Eastern Daylight Time, of course. Thank you again for joining us today for this important conversation. And just a reminder that we are recording this event. So if you don't want your face or name to be displaced, displayed, please black them out. And on that note, I turn it over to Dr. Daishaku Higashi. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, John, for your great introduction about myself. So let me show my slide for today. Uh, this one. Can you see the slide? Yes. How about this? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so I really appreciate uh, John, Professor John Tobe, who organized this event. Also, so I really appreciate uh, so many people who are coming to today's event. Uh, I'd like to talk about basically four things: the process for publishing, how can we end the war in Ukraine three challenges of ending the war in Ukraine, how can we overcome these challenges? And also my conclusion and a lot of Q&A for, uh, for many, many uh, times. So I'm really looking forward to your question and the comment. I started my career as a program director of NHK. 
a Japanese public TV company and I wrote, made a lot of documentary uh, on the international conflict, like a picture of war, Middle East peace talk, uh, spending uh, three months in Gaza, West Bank, and less life, and also North Korea nuclear crisis in 2003. And I made a rebuilding Iraq challenge of the United Nations by following a Kofi Annan, Secretary General of the United Nations, and I got a silver medal from the Correspondent Association in 2004 in New York. Then I wanted to be transferred to the uh, expert on the peace building. So I got my master and PhD in the political science in University of Columbia in Canada, as John told me, and I did the first research in Afghanistan East Timor. And then because of that, I became team leader for reconciliation and integration in UN assistance mission in Afghanistan in Kabul. And transferred to associate professor at the University of Tokyo, I completed my PhD from UBC. And then I was assigned to the Japanese Council and the Japanese mission to the United Nations, again in, you know, in charge of directing uh, Japanese activity on mediation and the peace building issues. I trust, you know, I returned to the academic and I got a tenure position from Sofia University, so I transferred to Sofia in uh, 2016. And I published my first English book, Challenge of Constructing Legitimacy in Peace Building, uh, in 2015. And then I conducted my research on not only peace building, but also mediation of South Sudan, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Iraq, and Timor Leste. And I published second English book, Inclusivity in Mediation Peace Building, from Edward Elgar of UK. And the, this is that what I argue in this book, but I will come back to this uh, chart later. Uh, and then Russia invaded Ukraine, so I went to the Turkey and also Moldova and also Saudi Arabia uh, in last summer to conduct my research on the mediation effort by Turkey. Uh, I interviewed many, many Ukraine refugees coming from the Ukraine to escape to the Moldova. And also I did a lot of engagement uh, with uh, top leadership of the Saudi Arabia, which tried to make some kind of a, a different approach to, to this crisis. Then I published uh, How Can We End the War in Ukraine, Limiting the Potential of the Mediation from Ivana Mishinsho uh, in February 2023. And so I basically want to talk about these particular books. And in terms of the Ukraine, as you know, uh, there's kind of stalemate. Uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine in February 2020, and now they control or occupy not all, but part of the four provinces, like Donetsk, Luhansk, uh, Zaporizhia, the Kherson's, and uh, in, as well as the Crimea's. Uh, and there's kind of statement between Russia and Ukraine, as you know. But my fundamental uh, position or proposition of this particular war is that after the end of the World War II, it became very difficult for global powers to create or maintain some occupation and also puppet to government by military interventions. Because the norm of self-determination and the anti-colonialism became very, very strong and resilient. So if you look at the many, many cases, those type of the war were ended when the global power decided to withdraw their forces. It was the same case in the French war in Indonesia and Algeria, when French decided to withdraw all the forces, the war was ended. In the Vietnam War, the United States made a military intervention to Vietnam, but after eight years war, uh, they decided to withdraw and the war was ended. USSR also invaded Afghanistan, and after 10 years of Maya, USSR you know, decided to withdraw the, all the forces from Afghanistan and the war was ended. The United States made military intervention to Afghanistan, uh, but after 20 years military fighting, the United States and Taliban had a negotiation, and the United States decided to withdraw the armed forces in 2021, and the war at least was ended. So I think even for the, this particular war, uh, important proposition for us, or common goal, could be to push Russia to withdraw its forces from Ukraine so that we can end the war. And specifically, I argue that there are three types challenges of ending the war in the Ukraine. One is a dispute of territory. The second is the issue of war crime. And the third is how to create post-war security framework, including Russia, as well as the issue of war compensation. So basically, it's about post-war security and economic arrangement. And in terms of dispute of territory, I always focus or think that it's very important uh, 
to focus to have attention on the important negotiation between the Ukraine and the Russia in person brokered by Turkey on March 29, 2022. And uh, in this particular negotiation, Ukraine delegation proposed uh, four basic things. One is to withdraw the Russian forces to the line of 24 February 2022. And second, but in terms of the Crimea, Ukraine proposed that this issue should be negotiated for 15 years after, after they ended the war. This was a proposition by Ukraine at that time. And also Ukraine will not enter the NATO. Uh, and also new security, Ukraine proposed creating a new security framework, including Russia and the P5. And uh, look at, looking at this proposal by the Ukraine, uh, Russian delegation basically agree on these efforts at the negotiation level, according to the US official, which was uh, which shared in the last September. So it's also true that Russia mentioned to BBC that they want to withdraw the forces from northern part of the Ukraine to create some confidence building. And they actually withdraw, but you know, kind of civilian casualties or deaths in the village of Butcha was founded. And for example, uh, Prime Minister of UK, Mr. Johnson, tweeted that this is a war crime and the Putin need to be you know, prosecuted. So Putin decided to uh, suspend it all the negotiation at, at once. But after many years, many years additions, this one could be one of the line that both of us can start or can use as kind of basis for the future negotiations. So now the position of Ukraine and Russia are very far uh, in, in this particular moment. Ukraine wants to take back uh, not only the uh, territory, which was started to be invaded by February 24th, but they want to take back the Crimea by military forces. And uh, Russia also said that they definitely want to keep that uh, territory. But after the years, the attrition and the fighting, uh, this proposal by Ukraine on March 29, 2022, might become some basis for the future negotiation. It might not be exactly the same, but it could be the basis. And in terms of this to be on a dispute territory, uh, President Zelensky actually defined that if uh, Ukraine can push Russian forces to the line of February 24, 2022. It's a huge victory for Ukraine until last June 2022. So it could be one of the realistic lines that we can uh, think of. Of course, I'm not arguing that the Ukraine should be should give up the Crimea, but it can be negotiated after the end of the war as Ukraine proposed in March 2022. So this is one of the key, I think, uh, question that we should, we should, we can discuss. In terms of the war crime, which is very sensitive issues, I think I will need to have some realistic approach on this. In case that Mr. Putin remains a power, if the prosecution of the Mr. Putin became the condition to make a peace deal, there's be, maybe there will be no end of war as long as Mr. Putin remains a power. Because there's a reality that no leader make a peace agreement by knowing that they will be prosecuted. Of course, if Mr. Putin is stepped down or like arrested by internal coup or something, it may be possible for his successors to hand over Mr. Putin to ICC, International Criminal Court, as Serbia did it uh, 20 years ago. But we need to be quite flexible uh, on these particular issues. And now Ukraine is insisting the prosecution of more than like 100,000 Russian forces, which might who might have committed war crimes. Uh, theoretically, in theory, it might be possible to prosecute this amount of the Russian forces if Ukraine advanced to Moscow to get unconditional surrender or defeat from Russia. As the United States or United Nations got unconditional surrender from Japan or West, you know, Germany in the end of the World War II, 
but is it really plausible? I'm a little bit doubtful because Russia now has 6,000 uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, whether or not it's possible for Ukraine to get unconditional surrender from Russia uh, should be something that uh, we need to seriously discuss. And if it's difficult, one of the way out for this war crime issue is to create some kind of like a truce and reconciliation committee, which might investigate, you know, fact about what is going on in this particular war, and uh, think about some individual compensation for victims. And it happened in, for example, some part in East Timor or South Sudan tried to do it. But uh, we can use this kind of past experience to overcome these particular questions. Third challenge is uh, post-war security framework. And the, uh, I think proposals by Ukraine on March 29 last year had some elements to create a new security framework, including Russia and the P5. And I think this is something that we need to consider very seriously. If Ukraine and Russia had you know peace agreement, it might be possible also for the Security Council to make a decision to dispatch some UN peacekeeping operation to maintain the ceasefire. Not for and not not for entire world, but not just for some times uh, to have uh, some uh, confidence building between the Ukraine and the Russians. Uh, but they need to have peace agreement at first before they start thinking about dispatching some kind of peacekeeping operations to maintain the ceasefires. In terms of the regarding war compensations, uh, it might be difficult for Russian leaders, uh, including the success of the Mr. Putin, to accept all out uh, war compensations. But it may be possible for us to apply some Japanese approach after the World War II. Uh, in the end of the World War II, the United Nations, the United States did not ask Japan or Germany to make direct war compensation because of the lesson of the World War I. So Japan did not make a, a direct compensation, but Japan made a lot of, a lot of uh, official development assistance to like uh, South Korea, China, and the many countries in the Southeastern Asia after the World War II. It was not direct compensation, but actually it was kind of part of the compensation about, uh, for what Japan did before the end of the World War II. So for in terms of Ukraine context, it might be possible to create, for example, reconstruction trust fund for Ukraine, and Russia will make a huge funding to it, and maybe together with the other donors. So I think there might be some way to, 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 to to overcome these issues. And now that talk about, so those are three key you know, challenges, I, I think, and there was some clue to, about how to, to overcome these challenges. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about four kind of question in terms of approach to overcome these challenges. First one is who can persuade conflicting parties. And I will go back to some argument that I presented in the latest English book, Inclusivity Mentioned Peace Buildings. Uh, in this particular book, I argue that in the post-conflict peace building phases, inclusivity or avoiding political exclusion is key to success. And also, but in the phase of mediation during um, um, conflict, inclusivity needs to be flexible. Because if, if you have too many political parties, it might be difficult to make a peace agreement at first, at first place. So we need to be you know, flexible in terms of the inclusivity in the phase of the mediations. This is the same for you know, who will play international actors. In the post-conflict peace building, I still argue the United Nations should play a central role because it can be perceived at least more neutral or you know, more impartial compared with the global powers. But in, in the phase of the mediation during armed conflict, in the end of the day, it's a global powers or neighboring state which have a leverage on conflicted party so that they can convince uh, those parties to make some peace, you know, to end the war and to make a peace deal or agreement. And in the context of Ukraine, war in the Ukraine, I argue that in the end of the day, it is the United States which has the biggest leverage on Ukraine on how to end the war. Because without support of the United States, it's very difficult for Ukraine to sustain the war. 
In terms of Russia, I think it's a China which has the biggest leverage on Russia because China keep importing oil and gas from Russia and China also has some diplomatic relationship uh, with, with Russians. And it, it may be important for some countries, possibly including Japan, to keep internal kind of secret discussion with the United States and China to create some common line to end the war. Uh, and I think February 24, 2020 line could be one of the line that maybe many, many actors can actually agree as a vision to end, end the war in the Ukraine. But this is my argument, so I'm happy to hear your opinion. The second question is who could mediate Ukraine and Russia? Uh, there is one good president, for example, that Turkey and the United Nations mediated Ukraine and Russia and achieved the grain export deal in July 2022, last year. And they succeeded exporting almost more than 30 million uh, tons of grain. Unfortunately, it was suspended in July 2023 because of the opposition by Russia. But this framework by Turkey and the United Nations could be the future uh, you know, framework for the peace negotiation. In terms of the, and also I want to ask, how can we make global momentum to end the war in Ukraine by engaging with Russia to withdraw its forces from Ukraine? And I keep arguing that it's crucial in order to create a global momentum in ending a war in Ukraine, I'm arguing that it's crucial for crucial not to frame the war in Ukraine as a battle between democracy versus autocracies. Because we still have about 55% of the country in the world which is not, not a democrat, dem democracy. You know, 55% of the in, entire state are non-democratic state, like, you know, a kingdom or autocracy or uh, emulates. But those countries still do not invade foreign countries and try to make occupation after the end of the world too. So it's very bad to, to define those countries as kind of part of the, the Russia because it eliminates it, 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 those 55% of the, the country. So it should be framed as a battle between the state which comply with the fundamental rule of international order, which is respecting sovereignty and not invading another country, versus state which do not comply with it. And it's true that 141 member states, including many, many non-democratic states, supported UN General Assembly resolutions to request Russia to withdraw its forces from Ukraine in March 2022 first and February 2023. So there are some overwhelming majority of support at least on this particular issues. And I also argue that Japan as the chair of G7 this, this year can keep making its effort to create global momentum to push Russia to withdraw its forces, working with India, chair of G20, and outreaching to the third world country in the Middle East, Africa, and the South Americas to create some global momentum to, 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 to push Russia to the war. So I, I made a disagreement in the Sunday debate with the Japanese foreign minister of Hayashi at that time, uh, and I made that kind of a claim or, and in the end of February. I don't know how it has impacted on, but in the beginning of the March, Japan approached to the India. And the Prime Minister of Kishida, Kishida went to India on March 20, to meet him, to, to meet the Prime Minister Modi in India, and that they appeal that it's very important to maintain the fundamental rule of international orders, and as well as enhancing partnership with countries in the global south. Japan also hosted the G7 summit in Hiroshima in May, and Japan chaired outreach meeting on the third day, inviting not only G7, but like Australia, Brazil, or chair of AU, or head of Pacific Island Forum, chair of G20, chair of ASEAN, South Korea, and Vietnam. So at least Japan tried to make some kind of global international momentum to end the war. And the question is how we can sustain it. The final question I want to raise on how to you know, overcome these challenges, how can we use the sanctions against Russia by the Western country, including Japan, to motivate Russia to withdraw its forces from Ukraine? 
And according to expert on sanction, including Daniel Dresner, professor at Tufts University in the United States, which published United, sanction, United State of Sanctions in the Journal of Foreign Affairs in 2021, Many experts argue that sanctions, which do not show the condition to remove the sanction, have never succeeded in changing the behavior of the sanctioned state, nor changing the regimes of the state. And many experts on sanction unanimously agree on this assessment. It's kind of a sense of not, it's kind of natural, right? If the leader of the state do not understand what they should do to remove the sanction against them, uh, there's no way for them to, to, uh, about what they should do. So it's very important to clarify the condition to remove the sanction if you want to make condition effective to change uh, to change the behaviors. And what could be the condition to remove sanction against Russia? Uh, miss this truth, Secretary of State in UK in the end of March 2020, 22, mentioned that sanctions against Russia should be removed when Russia withdraw its forces from Ukraine and stop military operations. So I argue that this is a kind of important line as a condition to remove at least some of or most of the sanctions against Russia in order to incentivize Russia to withdraw its forces. And But now the Western countries do not have any clear cut argument about what is the condition to, to remove sanction against Russia. So it, it might be maybe important to clarify it. So in conclusion, I raise three challenges, territory, war crime, and the war compensation the security frameworks. And I ask four key questions to overcome those challenges. One is about how to make arrangement between the United States and China, which has a big leverage on the conflict party. The second is who is a mediator, and Turkey could be one of them how to make a global momentum, and also need to clarify condition to remove the sanction from Russia. And there are currently so many wars happening in the world simultaneously, uh, as we can see, we are seeing the war in the Gaza. So I argue that it's very crucial for us to start discussing how to end the war, not only how to support the war with realistic approaches, and utilizing the lesson of our past experience. Uh, thank you very much for hearing. Thank you very much, Professor Higashi, for a very interesting and I think comprehensive sort of overview of the challenges that we face in this conflict. Um, I'm hoping uh, people will raise their hands and indicate that they want to uh, ask a question, but. Maybe while they think about that, I'll ask a question if I can. Yeah, um, so, I mean, one of the things that you uh, suggest is important and really necessary is that the UN should play a significant role in mm -hmm. this, in resolving this conflict in mediation and that sort of thing. But as you know, I mean, the UN has widely been seen as not very engaged in this particular conflict. And one can understand that this is difficult with Russia as a member of the P5. Uh, so it's not easy to, you know, for the UN to do just whatever it might want to do in this regard. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about you know, the constraints on the UN and the possibilities that it presents for moving some kind of negotiations forward. Yeah, thank you very much. So this is one of the key questions that I continue to pursue. And the um, one of the things that I try to show you is that it's not so easy for United Nations to play a very important or a crucial role, a central role in the phase of the mediation when conflict parties are still fighting. Uh, because United Nations does not have so much leverage on the, those conflicting parties. Once conflict parties have a peace agreement, I still believe or argue that United Nations can or should play a central role. When United Nations still has some good record of the nation building, a post-conflict peace building, compared with like a global power or powerful state, uh, including like uh, United States in the Iraq, Afghanistan, or Saudi Arabia, Yemen, or 
uh, Russia and Afghanistan. So, yeah, but Russia and Ukraine are still fighting. So in terms of the mediation during the armed conflict, I think the uh, role that United Nations can play is quite uh, limited. So it should be global power in the neighboring state, which have the primary responsibilities. But we also need to have some facilitator who can facilitate the talk uh, uh, between the Ukraine and the Russians. So it's a United you know, States which has a leverage on the Ukraine, and it could be China which has a leverage uh, on, on Russia. So those countries need to convince the conflicting party to end the war by making some peace deal, at least in the future. But we, you also need to have some uh, country which facilitate or uh, provide a place for, for the peace negotiations. And Turkey hosted a lot of peace negotiations between the Ukraine and the Russians. So it could be Turkey, which can actually play an uh, important role. But when Ukraine brokered or mediated the grain export, grain export deal in last July, Turkey actually worked together with the United Nations. I think calculation of Turkey was that if we, they get to have a, they join, uh, they get the participation of the United Nations, the process can be legitimate more. So I think this framework that the, you know, you know, Turkey makes some mediation between the Russia and Ukraine, but the United Nations also can will join it, could be one of the way. But I'm not quite sure that UN, UN can lead the process of the negotiations. In the end of the day, it could be the, like some member states which can get some trust from both sides. It was same in the peace negotiation between the you know, Taliban and the United States, which is a Qatar or provided some kind of mediation places. So, but the if, I don't know when it happened, it might be five years later or 10 years later, but if Russia and Ukraine make or achieve peace agreement, somebody might need to make some uh, intervention to, to maintain the ceasefire. And in this case, the United Nations might be able to play some role. Uh, there's now 100,000 UN peacekeepers to maintain the ceasefire between the Hezbollah and uh, Israel since 2006. And uh, yeah, at least the presence of UN peacekeeper in the border between the Lebanon and, the, and Israel uh, seems to maintain some level of the or well, seems to prevent all out war again between the Israel and the Israel in this particular crisis. So, uh, yeah, if Russia and Ukraine have a peace agreement, uh, UN might have a little bit more law. Uh, and it might be easier for Russia to accept the UN peacekeeper compared with like a NATO forces or uh, OSCE forces. But when we discuss how to end the war, uh, the what the United Nations can do could be quite uh, limited. Okay, we have a question from Alastair Edgar. Thanks very much, John. Uh, and thanks, Desaku. Um, you know, I value your ideas. Uh, we, we've spoken often enough in the past that, you know, I like this, like hearing what you think. Um, one, one observation and one question. The, the observation is, when we talk about the UN, uh, are you talking about, you know, the secretary at the secretary general, somebody like um, Professor Hasegawa, you know, an SRSG, that kind of UN, um, and what that UN might do, uh, and in that case, the less powerful, in any material terms that one might be, perhaps the more credibility you might have as a as a neutral party a negotiator or a mediator um at this the other side is the the political un the security council and of course if russia is willing to negotiate peace terms then the security council or others can can play a role um but that depends on as you mentioned the state parties involved mm -hmm. um so I, I just want to want you to clarify you know those those two different sort of types of un but the, then the question, um, and you touched on this in the presentation, what does a, 
what does this security guarantee look like for Ukraine? Um, and particularly, what does this security guarantee look like for Ukraine? Given the past, you know, mm -hmm. everybody said we won't do anything. Russia invades twice anyway. Um, Ukraine would want, I imagine, something equivalent to an automatic defense guarantee, like as if you were a NATO member state. But that is exactly not what Putin wants. So those two things, what, what UN and in, in practical terms, given Ukraine's experience with Vladimir Putin, assuming he stays in government, what does an actual acceptable security guarantee look like for Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, these are very important and the crucial question and the comment. In terms of the UN, yes, uh, we need to have a distinction between the UN Secretariat and the UN member state or UN Security Council, which, was com which is composed of the 15 member states. But unfortunately, when UN Security Council is so divided, it's not so easy for UN, Sec UN Secretariat to play a very independent role. And uh, when I interviewed and also made a lot of research about the Syrian peace process, it was a Stefan de Mitzraf, who was a boss uh, in Afghanistan, made a huge effort to advance peace process between the Assad government and the oppositions. But the uh, Assad government was supported and is supported by Russia and Iran, and the opposition was supported by Qatar, you know, Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, EU, and the United States. But those countries which support conflict in party have no same common vision on how to end the war. So ostensibly, they say that they welcome the mediation by UN Special Envoy Stefan de Mitsura, but on the ground, they continue to make support, or they continue to support a uh, conflicting party, like opposition of the Syria and also Assad government, to make some kind of military military victory. So in those environments, it's very difficult for a you know, special envoy to play some you know, substantial role. I think I argue my, in my book that even the United Nations could be abused uh, as a member state, which use United Nations as a gesture that uh, they are supporting peace process, but they continue to support uh, military element uh, or, or conflict party militarily so that they can make some, one side can make one side a uh, uh, victory. So, um, so uh, yeah, it, it could be great if U.S. Secretary or like a, or like a UN Secretary General can play an important role to make a facilitate a talk between the Ukraine and Russians. Uh, but you know, Secretary General already made it clear that Russia was uh, totally invaded. Russia's invasion is totally violation of the UN charters. He is very critical of the Russia and I understand it. So it might not be so easy for the United Nations to play a role in terms of the mediations. But if Russia and Ukraine make a peace agreement, we establish some kind of peace deal. Yeah, there may be something that only United Nations can do it. And this is related to your questions. What is a security guarantee for the Ukraine? In the long run, I'm sure that Ukraine want to enter uh, the NATO, want to become a member of the NATO. But we are not quite sure that how quickly the Ukraine can be member of the NATO. NATO did not like deciding the time frame, right? Because NATO that actually do not want to engage with Russia uh, militarily. So, um, so it might be possible that when Ukraine and Russia make a peace agreement, uh, they need to make some kind of security framework, which also includes Russia, to guarantee that they will not attack each other. And and in, and as a short term arrangement, it also might be possible for UN Security Council, if they agree, to dispatch some US peacekeeper, maybe composed by like African forces or Asian forces, not so much Europe, not so much United States. United States did not dispatch US peacekeeper anyway. So that for three years or five years, seven years, 
they might try to maintain some ceasefire between Ukraine and Russia. And it could be one of the security guarantees for Ukraine as a short term. But in the long term, I think Russia and Ukraine, also you, your NATO, need to make some serious discussions about even if Ukraine become part of the NATO, how they can, it will not threaten the security of the Russians. So, is it, but it could be more long term, I think, a conversation or negotiation that they need to conduct. But in the short term, I never thought dispatching a unit peacekeeper, but I got some insights from the professor in the Harvard, which I'm now visiting Scala. And it might be one of the options that we can think about. Yeah, I thought. But thank you very much for your question. Okay. Is that okay. I, yeah, I don't have your name, but it says Osvaldo Mena. So Daisaku, I think you know who that is with the <laughs> watch jacket. Um, yeah, Torisa, Dodo. Thank you, Professor Hiyashi, for the great talk. Uh, you have been uh, in the States for several weeks already. And from uh, being in the States, you may be seeing uh, more seriously the divide and instability of the US politics. Can we uh, count on the U.S. You know, given this uh, serious divide and the instability of politics for exerting necessary influence in bringing the, the order and the peace to the wars in different parts of the world? That's my question. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, there's a you know big chaos in the House of the Representatives in the United States. Uh, they just chose the new speakers, but... Uh, when they extended or avoided the uh, shutdown in October, uh, House of the Representatives decided not to fund uh, support for Ukraine. And uh, even for the next time, it might not be so easy for the US Congress to adapt some legislations to support, to maintain the financial support for Ukraine. Uh, they might, I'm sure they will support, uh, they will continue the financial support for Israel, but maybe we are not quite sure what happened to the Ukraine. So I have a, keep having a meeting with the UN Highland Court officially in New York right now, uh, since October 22. And there's a lot of narrative or oh, insight from UN official as off record conversation that uh, these things might request the Ukraine leadership to change some calculus or calculations that it might not be the case that the United States will fund or support Ukraine forever. So Ukraine also need to start thinking about what is uh, what should be the end game realistically. Uh, I still believe that it's very difficult for Ukraine people to accept some of the territory becomes a Russian territory, especially in terms of the territory that Russia invaded after 2022, February 2024. But if Russia agree on withdrawing the forces to that line, uh, Ukraine might want to, uh, it might be necessary for Ukraine to have some realistic uh, conversations within the Ukraine leadership on how to end the war, because it might not be the case that the Western country can support Ukraine for forever. So, but this is what I hear from the UN official uh, at the UN headquarters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Professor, <laughs> yeah. Professor Sukehira Hasegawa. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it was very, uh, comprehensive presentation uh, in our son, it was good. I will just uh, build on uh, the question what the Professor Tori in fact mentioned and, uh, and your response. I think we should uh, separate the two issues. In fact, uh, in our son is, is mentioning, but uh, one is uh, that of uh, a global geopolitical uh, issue reflected on the United Nations. And the other one is the operational uh, questions that uh, you, you addressed uh, 
uh, just now. I think uh, the UN missed the opportunity for security uh, led intervention that you mentioned, be it uh, sending a non, uh, non Western African and Asian mm. uh, peacekeepers and so forth. I, I did the uh, <clears throat> I did the talk with the uh, Ukraine ambassador here in Tokyo. Mm. We had three hours of talk. Uh, this was uh, April mm. of uh, uh, last year. It's about you know two months after the invasion, and uh, so my suggestion was at that time that uh, since Putin had conducted uh, sort of. Uh, Plebiscite on on his side on the Donetsk on Donetsk two 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 areas remember uh, Luhansk and uh, Donetsk these two but then he wanted to move forward before he would move forward the, my suggestion to the Grain ambassador which he found it interesting but he said uh, that would never be accepted by the uh, Zelensky and the leadership of Ukraine that is. I suggested that the UN should in, intervene uh, to hold the legitimate, not the elections of voting, to find out uh, the real, uh, you know, feeling of the people itself. Uh, remember, this was just two months uh, uh, after the invasion, and there are still very big segment of. Uh, Ukrainian peoples there. Uh, now they are all gone. Uh, the reason why I suggested is that uh, I think we have to look at the security element, not in terms of only uh, territorial issues, that is a Westphalian uh, you know, concept, but in terms of security of the people and what the people want. And that I think the UN has a role to play when it comes to deciding the legitimacy of any any uh, government or forces uh, trying to rule the territory. You know, uh, that uh, uh, the Western notion of uh, this rule of law is a, is a very convenient one for those who have already held the territory. And I think Putin was saying that, in fact, the people of Russian origin were oppressed, oppressed by a neo-Nazi or whatever he, he calls it. Now, I think that that is a very doubtful. But how can we prove it? I think we should have a UN-led verification mission there. And at that time, I think we, if uh, Guterres decided to use the uh, Secretary General's uh, this prerogative to raise the issue, and with the with the support and support of the United States is essential, but invoke uh, take it to the Security uh, General Assembly and have this uniting for the peace uh, resolution in the, in the Korea oh. or not places. Now, that that United States, you remember, United States didn't want to go that far. Yeah. And that 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 is a very fascinating one. You uh, the standard standard answer to that is that uh, because of the danger of Putin's using a nuclear nuclear weapons. But at the same time, if you remember what uh, Putin and uh, Joe Biden discussed in Geneva, remember six months before that uh, invasion. And I think many people were uh, missing that, uh, what they discussed. I think the Putin made a, in his own way, last plea, as you just explained in your presentation, as a part of a uh, ceasefire solution that uh, Ukraine doesn't join the NATO, remember? And do you know what was the answer 
to that particular demand by Putin, answer by Joe Biden said that the uh, United States is not really uh, pushing for that. But it's it's a uh, uh, Biden said it's it's a uh, it's a uh, Ukraine who wanted it. Now, I think that we have to also look at the validity of that uh, argument. We have to think about the eastward movement of NATO and even uh, NATO's proposal to set up office in Tokyo. Now, I think there is a there is another world. Can I respond it first? Yeah. Yeah. So my my yeah. my yeah. point my point is this, and maybe it's a question is that uh, I think we have to think in terms of what the UN can and cannot do with with the uh, conviction of the United States. To what extent the United States, in fact, wants to confront the uh, mm. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Hazira Sachi. This is a very central question about how to end the war. And the, let me go back to my slide. And uh, so now there's a two things that uh, uh, we are discussing, I think. Uh, yes, a Russian invaded Ukraine and now occupied some of the territory for provinces like Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. And that uh, is uh, annexed Crimea in 2014. So, and when they annexed Crimea, you know, Ukraine did not make a fighting. Yeah, they uh, kind of accepted it. Not officially, but uh, they gave us some, they gave Russia some, you know, uh, acquisitions. Then, if we argue that we should dispatch a peacekeeper in this particular line that now Russian, you know, controlled, yeah, I'm sure that many, many people in the Ukraine will oppose it. Of course, in the end of the day, it's only Ukraine people who can make a decision about how much they want to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the if we look at past experience, uh, you know, in the Vietnam. Algeria, Afghanistan, they keep fighting until they restore most of the territory from the global, from the global powers. But if Russia decided to withdraw the forces, as the United States decided to withdraw the forces from Vietnam, or as you know, Afghanistan, I'm sorry, USSR withdraw its forces from Afghanistan. If Russia decided to withdraw the forces to the line of the 2000 uh, 22 February, and if Russia and Ukraine agree on the ceasefire, theoretically it's possible for a peacekeeper to be dispatched to be those line so that, that they can maintain some kind of a ceasefire or security guarantee, not for uh, for long, but for at least for for short time uh, as a short time arrangement. So see, it's yeah, a very yeah. different thing yes, to no. think about. What, uh, no, 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 please let me what? finish. So it's a very difficult thing to, to dispatch the peacekeeper uh, according to the line that they control each each territory or you know to dispatch territory if Russia withdraws almost all forces to, from the side of the Ukraine. So, uh, and I, I, my assessment is that uh, it might be difficult for Ukraine to accept handing over some territory to Russia, at least this particular moment. Uh, in terms of the NATO's, yeah, I think a position of the Ukraine become very strict. Uh, they really wanted to be part of the NATO, and I don't know how we need to think about what could be the a line that the Ukraine and Russia can accept uh, in the end of the day. And the, one of the things I can argue is that if Ukraine and Russia can make some ceasefires in the line of the February 24th, and if they can dispatch or UN can dispatch some many peacekeepers, uh, it might become short-term security arrangement. And then Ukraine and Russia need to have some serious negotiation or discussion on 
it's still okay for Ukraine to become part of the NATO. But I think it's very important to have some some understanding with the Russians, or, or and, and the Russia will might want to create some new security framework which can at least make sure that the Ukraine will not become a threat for the Russians. So those are very you know difficult discussion, but. They, it's, I don't think it's very good idea for them to keep fighting until all the issues are solved. So my argument is that uh, it's better to finish the war first if Russia withdraws its forces to the line to February 24, and then maybe they can make uh, uh, some negotiation about post-conflict security arrangements. Okay, yeah, J just on that, this this time it's just a question. Uh, Hingari says that. Thank you very much. The difference between uh, Vietnam and uh, Ukraine. Now, in the Vietnam, it was the Vietnamese there remaining and fighting. And it took about 10 years. Yeah. I think Ukraine issues will take about 10, 15 years, you know, before they can find some sort of accommodation. The reason I is I, I, I'm asking you how many how many people of Union Ukrainian ethnic people are still in this area controlled by Russia? That that's a question because my my guess is many of them have been forced to leave. You see what I mean? The difference yeah. between so, so, so th there is, you see, that as far as people are concerned, there are less people. It's not, it's like, it's, it's like uh, Israel pushing all the, all the Palestinians in the Gaza, uh, North Gaza, out to the south. Now, if they are, if they are gone to the south, they will lose that territory. You see? And that's what the Hamas is doing. Hamas is keeping them, and as as they do, in, as as people as uh, these fighters do, they don't they don't mind militarily. Another ten thousand civilians will be killed, but there will be a one million. One million persons. Yeah, and uh, maybe there are many people who want to ask questions. So, Sengasis. <laughs> yeah, let me answer your question. Yeah, it's very sad that uh, I don't know how many years it might take to finish. But uh, yeah, in the end of the day, it's uh, people in the grave who will make a decisions. But uh, yeah, I think it's very difficult for international community to accept kind of a fact that if some country can invade another country and uh, Occupy the territory and uh, force people, people go out and uh, make some election and uh, uh, annex that that territory. I think it's very dangerous uh, precedent. At least after the end of the World War II, uh, many countries tend to respect the borders and uh, uh, national sovereignty. So uh, this is a line that I think we might want to keep. I think it's better to keep it. But at the end of the day, it's the issue of the Korean people. But uh, my worry is that now Ukraine also show very maximum goal in terms of the ending of war, including the prosecution of the like 100,000 Russian forces uh, and it's by establishing a, a special criminal court. So if that's the case, uh, even if territory issue was solved, uh, this war might be continued for many, many years. And the, I think we... Um, yeah, yeah, I think it might be necessary for us to think about that. Uh, when Vietnam had a negotiation with the United States in the party uh, until 1993, I guess, uh, they never asked the United States to prosecute uh, US forces who might commit the war crime because they know that uh, it's become very difficult for the United States to withdraw the forces and end the war. So they really focus on uh, negotiating with the uh, United States to withdraw its forces from the Vietnam, and uh, they achieve it. And now Vietnam is one of the big uh, military uh, alliance, not military, but at least alliance uh, for the United States to counterbalance China. So uh, let's see. So John, can you ask? The... Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, and uh, hopefully we can 
open the floor to another person who wants to ask a question. Yes, well, anyone who wants to ask a question should please do so. And you're welcome to write something into the chat. Um, Alistair Edgar has another question. Yeah, and I'm sure this one um, won't surprise Desaku um, because a lot of my work is around dealing with uh, war crimes investigations. And and you, you discussed this to some extent, Desaku. Um, the indictment of, of Putin um, by the International Criminal Court and, you know, his his minister for for children, um, if one wants to call her that. Um, do you think that this is actually an obstacle to negotiation? And even even if one could assume that one could negotiate in good in good faith with um with President Putin, um, you know, the debate about peace versus justice, is the indictment something that now prevents a meaningful peace negotiation because after all one would be negotiating a peace agreement with an indicted criminal no so what do you think um, about about this issue yeah this is one of the most uh, difficult issue to end the war in current world i mean in the past if both sides agree on the territory they can finish the war now we need to deal with these war crimes uh Yes, as long as Mr. Putin as a president and uh, remains the power, yes, it's a, it becomes an obstacle because P Putin never makes any peace agreement as long as he might, he might be prosecuted. Of course, technically, UN security, I heard that uh, UN security Council can suspend uh, prosecution at just for one year, I think, uh, but they cannot retreat the prosecution itself, even if there's some kind of political agreement. This is my understanding. I'm not sure you might give me some uh, insight for that, but uh, yeah, this has become very difficult issues. Uh, but as I mentioned to you, if Putin is stepped down, you know, uh, like uh, or arrested by internal coup, yeah, a successor might be able to hand over the, Mr. Putin to ICC and uh, uh, by making that uh, uh, Mr. Putin responsible all of this uh, invasion and uh, act of the act of the war. So uh, yeah, but it's very tricky things. Uh, but as I mentioned to you, if the Taliban requested the uh, United States to prosecute, some some war crime uh, because uh, U.S. bombing also had a lot of casualties. Uh, it might also create a big hurdle harder for for them to make any peace agreement. I I think it's the same for when the USSR invaded through Afghanistan. Afghanistan never requested uh, prosecution of the forces or leader of the USSR, and if they did it, maybe it was very difficult. Uh, I wish we are living in the world which has a you know, central government and the central government can apply all the law to the, every place. But this issue of the war crime is very tricky. Uh, International Criminal Court never prosecuted any person of the Israel, uh, no matter how Israel occupy, maintain the occupation in the West Bank and the Gaza and uh, make a lot of uh, collateral damage or a collective punishment to the civilian in, in Gaza and the West Bank. And uh, ICC never prosecuted uh, anybody by, from, the, from the United States. Even the United States has some military engagement in Afghanistan and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Iraq. So I'm not arguing that it's not totally Baseless, but there is an academic study that after international Crim criminal court is established, mm -hmm. it became very difficult to make some kind of political concessions. Because if leaders think that they need to they will be prosecuted, it very, very difficult. In the past, it was possible for those leaders to exile and to go to some Caribbean countries and to get arrested, but the war was ended. But it became very difficult for them. Once they are arrested, no, prosecuted. They might be arrested in all over the world. So 
Well, it's very tough questions. Uh, I wish we, uh, we can live in the world that all law can be applied to the all peoples. But until then, uh, we might need to have some political arrangement to end the war. And just to say, the, the the Security Council can suspend an investigation for a year, as you mentioned. The, the Office of the Prosecutor or pretrial chamber, but the Office of the Prosecutor, I believe, could choose in the phrases in the interest of justice to withdraw um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as well. So to advance political agreement, right? Yeah. So so there are some options, but right now the only other thing you could say, which is not applicable in this case um, for Putin, is, is an indictment might um, damage the internal political credibility of the leader, and that perhaps to some extent happened with Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, but there is no no competitor, no rival uh, yeah. Putin inside of Russia. None that stayed alive long enough anyway. Yeah, but still I hope that ICC limit the prosecution to the Mr. Putin and uh, another one person. Uh, if they started prosecuting many, many leaders, it became very difficult for those leaders <laughs> to make an internal coup because they also need to might be prosecuted. So yeah, in the end of the day, I think we need to have some political considerations uh, on those kind of issues. Yeah. So I, I I appreciate your insight and the knowledge. Yeah. So yeah. So I'm not seeing any more questions, but no, there's a Ryotaro Konto san. Sorry. There's a hand by Ryotaro Kondo san, maybe. I I don't see that, but no? Oh, no, no, it's my mistake, yeah. I mean, I'd be happy to continue the conversation, but if we have no questions... Yeah. I mean, you've already talked a little bit about American internal politics and how some of this plays out. Um, but I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> as perhaps a last question or perhaps uh, an opportunity for others to uh, come up with a question of their own, but uh, I guess I am wondering, you know, how, I mean, Biden in a speech that he gave shortly after the first attacks by Hamas, you know, linked the, in effect, the fate of Ukraine with that of Israel. And, you know, uh, leaving aside the domestic American aspects of that question, um, you know, it's having a big impact. What what happened in the Middle East, uh, what's happening in the Middle East is having a big impact in the rest of the world. So I'm wondering, you know, it's been noticed by many people that um, the Western position, if you like, on Ukraine has not necessarily met with great enthusiasm or approbation by many people in the sort of so-called global south um india perhaps most prominently mm -hmm. um so i wonder you know what would you say about the consequences of the new con conflagration in the middle east in israel which of course could get bigger we don't know um you know how does that affect the prospects for bringing peace to ukraine yeah, that's a very complicated question, and the, maybe John maybe know <laughs> much better answer. But my perspective is that uh, yeah, I, mm, yeah, I I think that in this particular war in the Ukraine, uh, Russia has a uh, one hundred percent responsibilities, and uh, Mr. Putin has one hundred percent responsibilities. So I continue to criticize. Yes. Uh, you Russia invasion to Ukraine and the occupations in some part of the Ukraine. And I believe that they should withdraw the forces from the Ukraine as soon as possible. And this is a wish or, or at least request by the 141 member states in the UN, UN General Assemblies. And if that's a so, I also believe that uh, we need to keep uh, criticizing the occupation by Israel in the West Bank and the Gaza. Uh, they already did it for 20, like 57 years or something. Uh, UN Security Council adopted resolutions 
to request uh, Israel to withdraw the forces from West Bank and and the Gaza. Uh, and it also show how it's difficult uh, for even very powerful state to maintain some kind of occupation because people have aspirations uh, to become independent, a self self determinant. And the United States uh, made a very important effort uh, until 2000. No, uh, may, has been making a very important effort to create some kind of two state solutions. So Israel withdraws the forces from you know West Bank and the gathers. Palestine will establish new state in those territories, and Israel, West, you know, Palestine's Palestinian state can coexist safely. Yeah, this was the vision, uh, which was uh, which was shown in the Oslo Agreement in 1993. President Clinton made a huge effort to make a mediation between the Israel and the Palestine, which almost made a peace agreement in 2001 and 2000 in Camp David. Uh, even President Obama argued that he really want to have a two-state solution, uh, basically by giving a state to the Palestine in the line of 1967, its West Bank and the Gaza. So Palestinian people know it, so I think it's very difficult for them to give up that aspiration. So, uh, and the many countries in the world in the south or global south or in the south of the country, you know that that history. So, yeah, I hope it will not divide the world more harshly so that, oh, you have a, so much double standard. You criticize Russia, which invaded uh, Ukraine, but you never criticize Israel, which keep occupation in the West Bank and the Gaza. So, yeah, I think. Uh, <clears throat> It's important for us to have kind of a same standard for the, some important uh, critical rule of international order. Now it's very simple, not to invade another country, not to make occupations, respecting the borders. And if you buy some good, you will pay for that good, right? So those kind of you know, basic fundamental rules need to be maintained in order to keep our international orders so that people can live safely. So uh, in short term, I'm not so optimistic that this war can have a positive impact on making a global momentum to push Russia to withdraw the forces from the Ukraine. But at the same time, uh, it also might show that Ukraine leadership, that the support for Ukraine might not be continued forever. So if that's the case, they need to make some realistic approach on how we can end the war by some kind of peace negotiation or settlement with Russians. I know that they need to have some principle that they cannot make a concessions, including some territories, uh, but uh, territorial issues. But yeah, for, for, for the rest of the thing, like a war compensations, a war crime, uh, they always can put those things to some specific mechanism after they end the war uh, with the Russians. So, and we need to create some security guarantee. And the dispatching the peacekeeping operation could be one of the options. If, only after, or if Russia and Ukraine make a peace agreement. So uh, this could be my final uh, statement. There's one question by the chat. It seems that Putin continued his aggression because the world is not stopping him. Somehow, aren't we all complicit? What did China, Britain, the US, Turkey, and Japan, for example, met with Putin just say, stop now, withdraw your army, give territory back, go home, and you won't be prosecuted. But any further aggression will result in prosecution. China needs to be on board. Yeah, I agree, basically. Yes, we need to have a conversation with China, which has a leverage on Russia. And this is what uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, former Secretary of Defense, uh, continued to argue bravely in the, in the American media that we need to involve China to engage with Russia to stop the war with all the forces from the Ukraine. And I don't think realistic or rationally, 
Russia does not get any benefit from this invasion to Ukraine. They got a huge sanction from the Western country. They had a huge cost in maintaining the occupation in the, in, in the Ukraine. They continue to have uh, the casualties. Many young people escape from Russia, many young Russian people, talented, escape from Russia because they oppose the war. So rationally, there's no merit for Russia. So uh, yeah, we, and also it's not so good for China, I think, to have this kind of a global, this kind of very dangerous war, which can be expanded to the global war for many, for many, many years. So yeah, we need to have some conversation with China and the United States, the Western countries, and also grow and the group and in a third world country, which have some uh, important uh, influence on the decision making of Russia, uh, to to have some common idea that what is a line or what is a way to end these wars. And I really hope that this very modest conversations with John and uh, another expert today can become one of the first steps to think about what is a vision to end this, this terrible war in the Ukraine. So thank you very much again, John, and uh, maybe you might want to have uh, some conclusive remarks. Yes, well, thank you very much uh, for those at least uh, somewhat optimistic thoughts about, you know, how this is all going to turn out. We appreciate your, uh, you know, thoughts about uh, the challenges that face us in bringing that war to a conclusion. Of course, it does seem to me that the the new conflict in the Middle East only exacerbates and complicates that other problem. So, but we need the kind of thinking that you're doing in order to get to that goal. And obviously our great hope is to bring these wars to an end. Um, I wanna thank Daisa, Dr. Daisaku Higashi from Sophia University in Tokyo. Thank you all for joining the conversation. I do wanna mention that the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies does an, a podcast series called International Horizons, which Professor Higashi has once done an interview for. Uh, and we have many, many topics that we address. It's available on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And we will post this uh, uh, conversation as soon as uh, we can get it ready for, for publication, so to speak. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I want to um, thank our tech guys, uh, Juan Acevedo and Osvaldo Mena Aguila. Um, I see that there's a chat, uh, something in the chat, but I, I'm going to bring these proceedings to a close. So thank you all for joining us. I know for some of you, it's very late. You're in Northeast Asia, and it's much later than it is here. Uh, but thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you very much for everybody. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate our great conversation. Uh, thank, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really